Hello. Today I want to introduce the Gestalt approach to thinking and learning, continuing this in the fifth video, where I will also talk about the Gestalt approach to memory. Although the major focus of the Gestaltist's research was the understanding of perception, right from the start, Wertheimer and the others saw Gestalt theory as far more than simply an explanation of perception, but rather as the basis for an entire psychology. One area of particular importance was their work on thinking, learning and memory. The study of how knowledge was acquired had been one of the chief interests of psychologizing philosophers, but it had been cast aside by the Wundtians, who made do with second-hand associationism, and had been narrowed to mindless stimulus response conditioning by the behaviorists. By contrast, the Gestaltists restored meaning and thought to the study of learning. Wertheimer himself made some of the first crucial observations shortly after his Frankfurt experiments on perception. Returning to Vienna, he was involved in a project to find ways of teaching deaf-mute children at the Psychiatric Institute. He found that if he demonstrated building a simple bridge out of three wooden blocks to a deaf-mute child, the child was able to copy his bridge, albeit usually after one or two mistakes. What was interesting was that having seemingly grasped the basic concept, the child then constructed a variety of bridges of its own, all sharing the common characteristics of two bricks of equal length, supporting a third horizontal brick towards its ends. These new bridges seemed to be based on the acquisition of a mental configuration, a gestalt, by the child. Wertheimer also read anthropological reports of numerical thinking by so-called primitive peoples, writing a paper on this in 1912. He noted that in the Pacific, some peoples had different ways of counting money, animals, and men, each with its own appropriate framework of understanding, or gestalt. Again, some peoples lacked the Western system of grouping and numbering, and used alternative systems based on natural groups instead. Some of the most famous Gestaltist studies of thinking and learning were made by Cola during his extended stay on the Spanish Canary Islands. After his work with Wertheimer, Cola had m remained at Frankfurt, but then, in 1913, aged only 26, was offered the post of director of the Prussian Academy of Sciences Anthropoid Research Station on Tenerife in the Canary Islands. Arriving in the islands, he was soon forced to stay because of the First World War. Spain remaining neutral throughout the war, and British observers thinking that Cola must be a spy because his research was so unconventional. He remained on the Canaries after hostilities had ended, and Germany remained in chaos, only returning in 1920 to an uncertain future. Cola's experimental work on the Canaries included his famous studies of learning amongst chimpanzees, his L-shaped fence experiment, and his chicken experiments. I will talk about each in turn. The most famous set of experiments which Kohler made on Tenerife were with chimpanzees. These are some of the most important experiments on animal mentality ever made, and after the war were copied directly in studies of humans. Although not couched in Gestaltist terms, his work was inspired by Gestalt ideas and confirmed its approach to thinking and problem solving. Most of these experiments involved seeing what the chimpanzees would do in order to obtain a desired food reward in the form of bananas. The context and structuring of the experiments were quite different from those of the behaviorists, however. The simplest of Kohler's experiments were merely detours, whereby the chimpanzees had to go by a more roundabout route to their desired bananas. In more complicated and more interesting experiments, Kohler effectively set the chimpanzees' problems to solve, providing them with possible tools to reach bananas that were out of reach, such as sticks, ladders and boxes. For example, in one experiment, Sultan, a male chimp, who had had nothing to eat all morning, was let into a room where a bunch of bananas was hanging from the ceiling, but out of reach. After jumping for them several times, Sultan prowled around the cage, making discontented noises, but then noticed a stick that had been left there. Picking it up, he tried to knock down the bananas, 
but they were still out of reach. Now very angry, he jumped around in rage, but suddenly rushed for a box in the cage, pulling it under the bananas, climbed up and seized his prize. Some days later, Sultan was again let into the cage. This time there was no stick, but two boxes. Straight away he took the larger box and put it under the bananas, but the bananas were higher up than the time before, and Sultan abandoned a jump when he looked at the bananas from the top of the box. He then jumped down and galloped around the room, shrieking with anger. Then, again suddenly, he put the smaller box on top of the first, and climbed on top of it to get the bananas. In both cases, Sultan had initially been unable to work out how to get the bananas, but then had seemed to have suddenly seen or understood the solution to his problem. Kola called this insight. It represented a sudden restructuring of the ape's view of the situation. Effectively, the presumed construction of a gestalt or paradigm to deal with the problem situation. Working with several chimpanzees, Kola noted variations in problem-solving ability. Some chimps took a much longer time to see that the boxes could be used to get the bananas and never did use them very well. Some were smarter. One female was able to stack four boxes when necessary. By contrast, one less gifted chimp stacked the boxes in the wrong place. Presumably, having seen other chimps use the boxes, he understood that the boxes were crucial to their success, but did not understand how. There were also limitations. None of the chimpanzees worked out how to use an available ladder effectively, propping it up sideways to the wall. Kola also provided the chimps with sticks to reach out of the cage to get bananas. Results included a female chimp that did nothing until some other chimps appeared outside the cage, whereupon she rushed to use the stick to get the bananas before the others did. That is, she knew the solution all along, but was not motivated to use it. Again, chimps were able to use a short stick that was too short to get the bananas to get hold of a longer stick outside the cage, which would be long enough to get the reward. Again, the chimpanzees discovered that two sticks, one with a hollow end join, could be joined together to make a longer stick that could be used to get the bananas. Kola thus observed a whole series of creative behaviours by the chimpanzees. Of course, these experiments were very different from Thorndike's trial and error learning experiments with the cats. Kola thought that Thorndike's puzzle box created a situation which predetermined the results because it gave no opportunities for insight learning. By contrast, Kohler's experiments were open-ended, allowing the chimpanzees to use their own intelligence if they could. His conclusions included the observations that, first, the chimpanzees' problem-solving was not dependent on rewards. They only obtained the bananas after they had made their own efforts to get them. This was not stimulus-response learning. Secondly, when the chimpanzees achieved an insight, they were able to generalize it and apply the solution in modified form to other problems. That is, they became test-wise. Again, there was obvious variation amongst the chimpanzees in terms of problem-solving abilities. Some chimpanzees were better than others. Kohler reported his findings in a monograph in 1917, and in a book on the mentality of apes in 1921, after his return to Germany. An English translation was published in 1925. Both the monograph and book had a major impact. In another set of experiments, Kohler constructed an L-shaped fence next to a wall and placed a reward on the far side. Here he examined the obvious variations in thinking abilities between species. Thus, a baby girl easily saw how to go around the barrier to get to the reward, in her case a doll, and similarly a dog could reach the food reward quite easily. By contrast, chickens were unable to solve the problem and remained within the fence, even though it was possible to reach the food. In a third set of experiments during his stay on Tenerife, Kola also made a pioneering study of learning, this time using chickens as the subject of his study. In one tedious but simple and enlightening experiment, he worked with four chickens. 
allowing two of them to peck at grain on a light grey square of paper, but shooing them away when they tried to peck on a darker square, whilst the other two birds were allowed to peck on the darker square, but not on the lighter. Chickens do not show much signs of intelligence, so Kohler found that it took many trials, about 400 to 600, before each pair had learned a particular behaviour. The first pair only to peck at grain on the light squares, the second pair only to peck on grains on the darker squares. Kohler then altered the shades of the paper on which the chickens had not been allowed to peck, but kept the shade on which they had been allowed to eat. The dark square for the first pair was changed to an extremely light square, and the light square for the second pair was changed to an extremely dark one. The associationist and stimulus response theories would have predicted that the chickens would continue to peck on the square that they had been trained to peck on, but this was not the case. Instead, the first pair pecked on the new lighter square and the second pair on the new darker square. In neither case was this the one that they had been trained on. The Gestalt perspective provided an explanation for the change of behavior. The chickens had not learnt to associate food with a particular colour, but with a relationship. That is, they had learned a relationship rule. Kohler repeated this experiment with chimpanzees and a three-year-old child, this time with two boxes, with a food reward or candy inside one of the two. Again, the learnt association was with the brighter of the two and not with a specific box. Again. A relationship rule had been learnt. By showing conclusively that animals learnt a relationship between the colour options, which they then transposed to different situations, Kohler had overturned a basic belief of the Wundtians and behaviorists. Solomon Ash, a former student of Wertheimer, later observed that this illustrated a general rule, that animals and humans learn nearly everything in terms of relationships. This object is on top of that one, this object is between those two. This object is bigger, smaller, earlier, later than the other, and so on. Relationships were key to perception, learning, and memory, a theme which we will continue to examine in the next video. Thank you.